Hawaii, 1978. A Hawaiian's version of an announcement, a call, a reminder, a sad ballad, a connection with his ancestors, a call to his brothers and sisters. It's a cry, it's an incredibly emotional cry of the end of a way of life, not just the physical, geographical place. Could you just be imagining they were around and saw highways on the sacred grounds? How would they feel about this modern city life? How would they feel about this modern city life on the ancient burial grounds? So the people are in great, great danger now. <clears throat> so uh, in 2017, I had the call to leave the place I was living. Let me think if it was 2016. 2016. I had the call to leave where I was living in Santa Barbara, California, because it was becoming too challenging to live. It was, you put a place to rent on the uh, internet on Craigslist and you'd have 160 phone calls and for your open house, you'd have 50 groups show up uh, on a Saturday afternoon. It was just incredibly crazy. You had all these people <clears throat> from all over the world, mostly America, coming to Santa Barbara, trying to find an old school place to live that was safe, had good climate. I like it because it didn't have mosquitoes because I grew up in New Jersey with lots of mosquitoes and France, a lot of mosquitoes there. So um, I moved there and I thought, hey, where do you go when you leave Santa Barbara? <laughs> Hawaii, where, where else in America can you go that's nicer than Santa Barbara? And so I moved there and I soon to realize that Santa Barbara was still with me. It was very difficult to find a place to live. It was very difficult to find work and connections uh, through networking, whatever you want to do. It's very challenging. And there was a lot of difference in uh, scales of, of income and assets. Uh, and I'll explain that in this video, what I found. So first, I'll start off with a little story about Hawaii. In the olden days, in the uh, Renaissance time, the English were in Hawaii. I think they were there for about 100 years. And this video, I haven't read up on Hawaiian history like I knew it in 2016 and 17, but I'm going to give you my broad sweeps of recollections on the history that I read and studied at that time. So the English were there for um, a period of time. It might have been a century if you added it up all the years they were there, maybe 100 years. And they are seen as not having done a lot of damage and being somewhat, not perfect, but somewhat good stewards, uh, bringing their modern ways to Hawaii and somewhat of a co cooperative situation with the Hawaiian Islanders. So not a complete positive, but certainly not a complete negative. A positive, if you had a clash of cultures, it's about as positive as you, as you could imagine for a Renaissance time with a very powerful advanced place, advanced in terms of technology and arm, armament and shipping and all these types of things from the English, uh, the, the British coming to the Hawaiian Islands. And then um, when they left and the Hawaiians uh, were vulnerable, you know, these very big, strong people uh, being vulnerable, you uh, wonder what's going to fill the void. and you know, they're a culture that, yeah, there was warfare and there was some domination and there were these types of things. But there was also this aloha spirit. You're in this island paradise 
where there's plenty of food. Um, I would guess if you looked at the history of Hawaii from the last 1,000 years, very seldomly would you find a food shortage. All kinds of fish. They knew how to farm fish in these fish ponds where the fish come in and they feed them and they can't get through the, the gate on the way out because they're too big. So they could just walk down and pick dinner right out of the fish pond with a net or with their hand, just walk into the fish pond and there's dinner. And then they can go out and fish in their, in their canoes and their boats. And then they could uh, hunt boar. I think the boar came there with the, uh, with the English and other shipping people dropping off pigs that became wild pigs and, and then boars, et cetera. So that, you know, Hawaii is going to stop of international trade and transportation uh, because of the trade winds and because of where it was located. It was a spot between places like between Australia and California. You know, that would have been on the, the route, you know, Japan, et cetera. So it's a perfect stopover place. And the pirates were there. So the pirates dropped off things and brought their things with them too. So you have this vulnerable place that's a, <clears throat> if you're thinking militaristically in trade, it's the perfect place to want to have as part of your country or your empire. So at, at the time in the 1800s, the late 1800s, where you had countries in Europe all over the world, you know, they say the sun never set on the British empire. You had the Belgians in the Congo and other places. You had the Portuguese in Brazil and other places. So uh, the Dutch West Indies and the Dutch in many places, South Africa. So you have these European advance in terms of technology and warfare and trade and shipping. You have this advanced society, gunpowder, et cetera. And so they go to different places and they, uh, they set up their trade and they set up their, their way to buy influence. And, and they do these things and not always a nice way. You know, if you look at the, just pick the British Empire and what they did with India and the later country of Pakistan, it's, it's pretty mean and nasty stuff, um, lining up people and shooting them and uh, treating them uh, as far lesser people and paying off the higher ups to, uh, to, to gain power influence. So who's gonna do this to Hawaii? That's the question. And I'm not stating these things as a judgment call. I'm just saying that this is an ine inevitability in the class of cultures and in the um, will to survive and have power over other people, especially if you're from a country where you've got, like let's say you're in England, you've got 10 brothers and sisters and only one or two of them is going to get your family's estate to be able to farm on. And the rest of you have to marry off or join the military or join the clergy or open up a business. Well, one or two brothers may want to take off and go to Hawaii in the 1800s, 1700s, 1600s, what have you, and set up shop and be their own little prince in a place where people don't know what they know and they don't come from this uh, amassing power type of a culture like the uh, the Europeans were for um, more than a, a few millennia. So somebody has to go to Hawaii and figure out what they're going to do with Hawaii. That's just the way the history is going to happen. So the Germans have it on their radar. The Japanese have it on their radar. Many other countries have Hawaii on their radar. They've gone through trade. Imagine you're in the 1700s and you come back and you tell your father and brother about this island, Hawaii. Well, one of you, let's say, is a power hungry person. And he says, I want to go over there and take over this place. So this, that's the same way it happens in any century. And it happens today. Um, if our you know, CEOs have brothers and their brothers are as power hungry as the CEO, they want in somewhere. You know, they might, might want in with a here's the parent company with a subsidiary company, something, or, you know, doing business with the parent company from their business that they set up, you know? And uh, so this is just how it happens. So somebody's gonna go to Hawaii and dominate. Who's it gonna be? Well, here's the story I read in a book about the uh, four-star general MacArthur from World War II. And a West Point graduate fought in World War I, as did Patton, and I believe Eisenhower also fought in World War I. And if he didn't, he was very involved soon after World War I in the military, tank training, it was Eisenhower. So <clears throat> Brigadier General Arthur MacArthur, 
who's General MacArthur's um, father, uh, was in Hawaii. I think it was on the island of Maui in the late 1800s. And he walked out of a meeting in Hawaii and uh, he was shaking his head with sadness. And he walked into a bar and there were a few military police people there, MPs. And there was a journalist happened to be sitting next to them drinking. And uh, they said, what's wrong, General MacArthur? Ar this is Arthur MacArthur, uh, the father of World War II, Douglas MacArthur. And he said, shaking his head, sadness. He said, we're going to take Hawaii because the Germans have their eyes on it. And I've told this story to Hawaiians who've studied Hawaiian history, grew up in Hawaii, and they go, really? We never heard that. How did you know about this? I don't know why it hasn't been written up widely. And not that I've read every book on the history of Hawaii, but this is a book on General Douglas MacArthur. And it's a scholarly book that would have been written in the, uh, I would guess somewhere around 2003. It's a big thick tome. You can find it on online and at your library uh, if you're lucky. And, uh, and so in that book, that's where I found this one. And I said, that makes perfect sense because you want to have the island of Hawaii ahead of the Germans. The Germans were in Mexico. You've seen movies where you'll have a, a German motor vehicle and the people with the pointy hats driving that around in the dust of Mexico in the, 18, in the, in the late 1800s and early 1900s. So this is Germany all over the place and America also influencing wherever they can. And so they want to they grab Hawaii. And they did. And it was a nasty way they did it. I don't want to give the full history of that right now, but you could look it up and see how they did it. You've got the, the, the children, mainly the, uh, the sons of the uh, plantation owners who, were, who went, uh, they called them the missionary boys or the missionary children. So they were missionary kids or grandkids or great grandkids who were there from the Christian missions to clothe the Hawaiians and bring them Christianity and a lot of sadness and sorrow and all the other stuff that a lot of the religions preach back in, in the day and still do, not criticizing every part of every religion here, but the cultural things that they do to clothe people and bring the sadness and the, um, the penitence and uh, the uh, readmitting your sins over and over this, this type of thing is a part of what they do, and it and it has an effect, and it has a very strong impact on cultures where they didn't have a lot of rapes before they put all the clothes and the sorrow and told them that sex was bad. They didn't have the history of rapes. Man, I didn't write that history. I've read that history, so look that one up. And a world without rapes and a world with more freedom of your physical body and not uh, going crazy every time you see a, a, a pair of breasts walking around, I think that would be a good thing. I better zip up my jacket here. Now I'm getting a little too close to, close to my breast. So, so the Americans grabbed, the Americans were a rising force. The, the British were a pinnacle, at the pinnacle of their force before a fall, uh, which happened probably starting in uh, the 1930s. And, you know, there's probably other dates that people will pick. But um, after the First World War and before the Second is where the British Empire started to, to disintegrate. And, uh, and then finally, you know, losing uh, India um, under um, Gandhi uh, in the aftermath uh, of Gandhi, you would, you would see the end of uh, the, the influence of the British there. And then it could only be normal business and more normal politics. It wasn't an imposing military force uh, running in India. So Hawaii has that interesting history. It's a sad history and this brother is who passed away 20 years ago um, with his um, fellow uh, songwriters wrote this song, Hawaii 1978. And it's such a sad song, but it's, it's a talk about how they lost their land. They had all this aloha spirit, which is the, the welcome and come share with us and share the good times of, of life, life with us. Watch some of the hula, honor the hula and, uh, and take a look at our island paradise and see what you think. And, and uh, go back and tell other people you had a good time with us. So there's the aloha spirit in a nutshell. So what happens? Well, the Americans come in, military force, and you know what happened in World, World War II. You, you've got Pearl Harbor and the air bases bombed uh, on, uh, on these islands, on uh, Oahu predominantly. 
But if you're on Oahu and you go over to Kaneohe, the Japanese had a plan, I believe from the 1930s through the uh, 19, early 40s, where they were going to invade Kaneohe with ships and with planes and take Hawaii uh, from the Americans. Can you imagine that? So that was, this was back in the 1930s and 40s. And then you had um, Pearl Harbor and then later uh, the battles with the Japanese and uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So there were Asian people coming to Hawaii starting in uh, the 1700s, Asian people, workers, working on in farming, working in shipping, working in the fish trade, all these types of things, and uh, hard jobs. And these people had to grin and bear it. So you have that influence in Hawaii. You have the native Hawaiians, which are a mix of, of many different people, and they're not all big. The history of, of the giant people are more Samoa and Tonga, not as much Hawaii. Uh, this, there were big Hawaiians, but there are also a lot of Hawaiians who are, who are smaller people, more like uh, other Asian people. And so these, the Hawaiians are here, Americans are here, uh, some of the uh, vestiges of the British people are there, and then all kinds of international people. And then the Asians, the Chinese, the Japanese, coming there to work in times of scarcity throughout history. So then later on, after uh, the Second World War, you have this incredible economic boom. And then you have tourism. So if you look at tourism back uh, pre-World War II, it was more local tourism. You had, you know, with the automobile, let's say in America, you had families that might have driven eight to 10 hours to go on a trip, but normally two or three uh, before World War II. Not, not a lot of air travel for the regular people before World War II. And then after that, the air travel starts to pick up. So it becomes more sophisticated. Oil and gas is, are very cheap uh, compared to uh, income, even though income was low. And people started to travel by airplane. And then the movies that came out later uh, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s that showed Hawaii, uh, Blue Hawaii with Elvis. And the funny story there is you had all these young people in their 20s and it was a movie called Blue Hawaii because of the Blue Pacific. But the they, people who worked on the movie said it actually was Blue Hawaii because all these 20-year-old people, I think Elvis was in this one, were partying all night long and drinking and uh, marijuana and sex until 5 or 7 in the morning. And then they go to get a shower and they'd show up uh, at 7 or 8 in the morning to be on the movie set. So they were blue. That's the joke of these 20-year-old people. Blue Hawaii, they were actually blue people that had to be made up to put color back on their face because they were exhausted from partying all the time. So you have these Asians moving there, Americans moving there, and then eventually with affluence, you start to have these wealthy people that need a place to live. So these condominiums and these apartments start going up in Waikiki, in Maui, in uh, Kauai to a certain extent, and you have these giant things going up. At the same time, throughout uh, the um, domination by the, uh, the, the whites from America, you, you have the taking of the land from the Hawaiians. So before that, you had the missionary kids buying land and taking land from the Hawaiians, right? Because the Hawaiians didn't have a, a monetary system and a lending system. But the, uh, the missionary kids and, and the, uh, the industrialists did, and they, they know how to do that, and they know how to pay people off in the, uh, in the local um, trust departments at banks and in the political um, uh, municipal um, rights to land departments. Um, ¿Cómo se llama lo, los derechos de la, de la tierra en la ciudad la municipal? Um, the local, not escrow and title, the yeah, the municipal title office, right? The tr property property ownership offices. So there was a lot of the stealing of the Hawaiians' land that were in a family's uh, possessions for a long time. You know, whether it was fifty years, eighty years, what have you, it was in their family. Maybe it was in there for six hundred years. Who knows? So <clears throat> that land was much of it was taken from the Hawaiians by people with shady deals and and uh, underhanded acts. And so that's part of this culture that you go to now in 2020, and there's unrest about that. You don't meet people 
who grew up in, in a, on a farm with a house and they were kicked off back in the 60s, 70s or 80s um, fraudulently to a certain degree or a complete degree by people with money and influence. And it's, it's really sad. So you feel that from the Hawaiians. You have uh, Japanese and Chinese and other Asians, Filipinos over in Hawaii that also had some land and some of them were kicked off too of their land. So they're not happy. So you have a lot of unhappiness and unrest and people that don't have a way to live, yet they have these families with 100 people or 30 people in them with their cousins and uncles and aunts. And they're not doing too well. Many of them are not doing too well in the current day because they're, they've lost hope. And if you're 50, 70 or 60, 80, whatever, and you've lost hope and you're not young anymore, how are you going to go out and work to pay for your insurance, your rent, your food, all the normal expenses? So this is what's been going on. And me being a very sensitive person and a sentimentalist, I feel it. And it's, it's hard. It's hard on the system to feel this over in Hawaii. Then you have the new people, the aff people suffering from affluenza, affluent people. So you're walking down the street, a person like me, whether I've got sunglasses and a big sun, I want to get a nod occasionally from people that I'm passing by. The new Asians, not all of them, but many of them because of their culture, Korea, Japan, and China and other Asian countries will walk like this. There'll be their two kids in tow and they'll be walking and uh, maybe holding hands with the kids and they'll be walking by and they won't even look at you. So how do you connect with somebody who doesn't look at you? And am I criticizing their culture? I am and I'll tell you why. Their culture's history is from being overpopulated. That's one reason they don't look at you because if you're overpopulated, you can't connect with everybody. That's one reason they do it. Japan especially, overpopulated for hundreds of years according to an agrarian society's history, way too many people. Um, so overpopulation. Second on the list is you have all these different classes of people. And so if you don't know a class of person by their dress, um, you, don't, you certainly don't want to make eye contact with them and you don't want to acknowledge them. And if you do know their class and they're higher than you, you're not supposed to look them in the eye. So this is all old bullshit. You don't need that part of your culture anymore. And I'm American. And I'm the first to admit we have many problems in our culture. One is the fake smile. I just got a call from a friend in France yesterday. She told me about this woman she's friends with is American. And she's got that fake American smile. It's like, oh, everything's fine. Oh, it's good to see you. It's phony. It's not always phony, but there's a lot of that phony smile in America, the glad handing which means, hi, how you doing, Stan? Good to see you. All the wife and kids, all this kind of stuff. That's the American phoniness. You can be cordial, you can be nice, but you don't have to roll your head back and smile and be happy all the time. Men and women do it, but it's very common in certain females that go to Europe. The, uh, the Europeans pick this up, and I'm sure they pick it up in Asia, the phony smile. It's overdone. We don't need that. But these Asian people, so you got the overpopulation, You've got the different class structures. And um, there was one more reason for the, uh, oh, during the Mao revolution, you have the communists controlling everything. And you certainly don't want your neighbors to know what you're doing and what your finances are, what your food supplies are, because they want to take your property because the small plot farmers in China under Mao are starving. They have to feed all of the hierarchy, all the government bureaucrats in the big cities and the big towns. They have to feed them because those people are not working. They don't have access to food. The only food they can get are from these plot farmers. And the plot farmers have to provide all this food, yet they don't have enough for themselves. So to bring on um, death, suicide for themselves, they would actually eat dirt because it hastens death. It's very uh, it's a horrible death, but it's better death than starvation, which can take weeks or months. You die from water within 17 days. You die from lack of food within a few months. It's a horrible death because you're weaker and your intestines, it's just you, you block up. It's a mess. Your uh, peristalsis doesn't work and you don't um, get your excretion going. So it's a terrible thing. So those are the three reasons that I'm leading with. 
on the Asians not looking at you when you go by. And I think they should just get rid of it. You don't need it anymore. It, honoring our cultural past. No, not anymore. You don't need to honor the stupid parts of your cultural past, right? You don't need to do that. To the, you know, the, the Arabic mythology with the dagger and, you know, the old, uh, you know, the old mytho mythological stories of the Arabs and the dagger coming up and cutting your throat. Do we honor that? No, we don't honor that. So why do we honor these silly things like not looking at your neighbor walking down the street? So there's a few things for, for my, uh, my impressions on Hawaii. There are lots of reasons why, in my opinion, Hawaii currently is uh, a cluster F-bomb. And it is. It doesn't mean the, I'm not saying the Aloha spirit does not exist. It does. It's there. It's present. I felt it. I've passed it on to other people. I've communed at, uh, at lovely dinners on the beach with Hawaiians, locals who brought me into their family for an evening. It was wonderful. I learned to dance hula. I got pretty good at hula for uh, the time I was there. And I'll break it out for you sometime when I work on it a little bit because it's been a few years. But um, so there's a lot of lovely things. I played golf there. I swam there. I did all kinds of things. But the condominiums built by the big money, and the big money is coming from America, China, Japan, and Korea. Those are the, the four main places. America, China, Japan, and Korea, four main places. Condominiums, no way you can move. Kauai is a pain in the neck to drive. No cheap hotels on the entire island of Kauai. Uh, Timeshares everywhere, Maui, Kauai. And, uh, you know, the big island of Hawaii is known as the old school island. It's more peaceful. There's not as many big developments there. But there's also, if you, if you want to have more activity, there's not a lot of activity there. I like activity. I'm currently 57. I still like to have activity where I can go out, intermingle, get in, intellectual stimulation, do some dancing, go to meetings, art, art galleries, and conferences. There's a lot of that in Honolulu. So that's why I lived on the island of Oahu, because I could participate in that. But um, I think, uh, you know, the world, you could say uh, Austria has a, some of the same problems. I've lived there twice in the last three years in the summer. I met a, a, a person who said she lives in a town on one of the famous lakes, like a Sound of Music type lake in Austria, and I said, is it worth visiting your town? And she said, well, to tell you the truth, these big busloads of tourists, many Japanese, come through and it becomes Disneyland three or four days a week in the summertime. These giant buses invade this small village on a lake and it just becomes Disneyland. So this is a big problem in the modern world. So people could say, well, just live and let live. Well, I'm a sentimentalist. I'm looking back at the good old days, and the good old days were before we became overpopulated, in my opinion. We're overpopulated. There's just too many people with money that want to see things, and they have good reasons to want to see things. They want to go out and enjoy life and learn. But let me give you an example of what you see in Hawaii, okay, Honolulu, at the Ala Moana Mall. This is a story, and this is a critical story of a Japanese tourist group. So I have uh, I met a person who works in the high-end golf store with the really expensive clothes, $120 shirts, $150 pants, uh, golf gloves for $30, you know, on and on. The um, umbrella's up to $100. It's, it's a high-end golf store in Yellow on Mana Ball. And this woman's uh, Chinese born in China. And, uh, and still uh, probably works there. But here's the story she told me. I said, uh, I said, is business good? And she said, business is incredible. And she said, from whom? I said, from whom? And she said, the Korean and the Japanese tourists, mainly women. So these women, they come in with often, a lot of them have fake boobs, not often, I should say, but a lot of them have fake boobs and it's all about the look. So this is why I'm saying this is nothing like their, their great, great, great grandparents who would dress up in a nice outfit and be peaceful and honor and spiritual and maybe things like Tai Chi, you know, maybe, not always, but culture revolved around food and family. Now you've got this affluenza. So this Japanese woman, fake boobs, comes in with her friends. And now all of a sudden it's a buying competition. It's a buying competition. It's not about let's go out and learn about the Hawaiian lifestyle, the Hawaiian culture, the history go out and go on a, a skin diving trip and, and connect and, you know, be nice to the coral reef, et cetera. 
No, it's about let's show how much money we can spend on our boobs and our shirts and our golf equipment. And are we going to go out and work on our golf game? Oh, we might go out and take a lesson and be horrible golfers because a lot of these people with these really fancy outfits are horrible golfers. They, they can't break 120, but they go out and they spend all this money because their husband works at a big bank in Tokyo. So huge stereotype, but it's true. I guarantee it. It's true. I've seen it. I've lived there for almost two years out of three years. I've seen it over and over, and I've talked to these people. I've gone up and talked to them. So this is it. They go in, and they buy it. And I said, so when this, this little group of three Japanese women in their 30s came in to buy stuff, what did they buy? Oh, this, that, and they named all the things they bought. I said, what is the average ticket? Like, what did they spend? Take a guess what they spend. This is in 2017. $2,000 in about 40 minutes. $2,000 in 40 minutes. Do American people do that? Yes, they do. Is it a part of a big part of our culture, buying that kind of stuff and being a rotten golfer and all about the show? In LA and Newport Beach, it's a huge part of the culture. On Long Island and Manhattan, huge part of the culture. It's probably in Chicago. It's probably in Minneapolis. We're seeing this all over. However, it's a significant part per capita of the wealthy Japanese, Korean tourists. And I imagine Chinese tourists too, because they've been going through a period of affluenza uh, the last 10 years, 20 years. So all these countries are suffering from this. So what's the moral of the story? I don't know, keep living and learning and appreciating the authentic good history. Not all of Hawaii's history is good, believe me. You can look that up. It's not all pretty. There were struggles for power. There were battles, you know, all kinds of nasty stuff. But the authentic, best authenticity you find in Hawaii is treating the planet well, treating other humans well, welcoming them with the aloha spirit, sharing food, uh, honoring your time with joy and the aloha spirit, and uh, and being for, forward thinking, not thinking about all these pineapples we have to grow this year to make a lot of money like the missionary kids did. And now the Dole Factory uh, is a museum over on Oahu, and there is some pineapple being grown, but it's not grown there anymore for the most part. It's grown elsewhere. So that's the moral of the story is appreciate authenticity and don't go in for all the modern fakeness with the fancy outfits and the fake boobs and even the tattoos, I think, is, has gotten out of control. You know, the reasons for tattoos that are historic and it's not about uh, just outshowing everyone else. There are things that are memories that were uh, or, uh, part of the history of tattoos originated those those things, initiated the reason you'd want to get a beautiful work of art. It's not to say how fancy and cool and, and rebellious I am. No, I and mean, there's a bit of rebellion in everything we do or many things that we do, I should say. But the way we do tattoos, I'm going to come back at you in another story in the future. So I'm Sifu Slim, SifuSlim.com. Please like, please subscribe, and please leave your respectable, respectful comments below and I'll do my best to uh, go through any ones that have questions and uh, please share with your friends and uh, hope you uh, tune in for more of these in the future. Aloha ke akua. Mahalo. Cry for the lives, cry for the people, cry for the land that was taken out, and then yet you find a way. Could you just imagine if they came back and saw traffic lights and railroad tracks? How would they feel about this one city life? Tears 